Today on Detroit Muscle, we'll show you how to rebuild one of the most popular overdrive transmissions ever plugged into an engine. Plus, it's a trip to the Tri-5 Nationals. Chevrolet has been putting automatic transmissions in vehicles since the early 50s with the introduction of the Power Glide. Well, today we got three of its successors in here to show you how to identify them, rebuild them, and upgrade them to transfer the power in your muscle machine. These are the two most common automatic three-speed transmissions, the Turbo 350 and the Turbo 400. The 350 pretty much came in any and everything until you needed something heavy duty or you had something a little more high performance. What we're wanting to do is switch over to something with that extra gear that gives us that overdrive, the 700 R4. Now, if you're looking for a GM automatic transmission for your project, chances are you're gonna find yourself flat backing it in a salvage yard somewhere, trying to figure out which one you're looking at. Well, it's pretty easy to tell the difference. This is the Turbo 350 here. It's a basically square transmission pan with the corner cut off. Now, the Turbo 400 is a little bit different. It has a shape of maybe Ohio, kind of. But the one that we're really interested in is this one that's almost exactly square, the 700 R4. Now you may have already noticed that this particular transmission is missing the tail shaft housing. That's because it came out of a four wheel drive truck. Not a big deal because once we're already inside, we can switch it over by changing the output shaft and adding the tail shaft housing. Well, here we've laid out everything you're gonna need to overhaul a 700 R4. It comes in a kit from TCI. It includes all the clutches and steels, a new high performance filter, all the seals and bearings, and of course a complete set of gaskets. And since the OEM sun shells are a known weak point and can even cause you to miss a gear, we got this replacement from TCI known as the Beast. It's extra strong and comes with a completely revised spline area. After draining all the fluid out of our old 700 R4, first thing to come off is the pan. We gave ours a good cleaning, tossed in all the new friction plates, gave them a bath in Royal Purple Max ATF. We'll let them soak until we need them later. With the 2-4 servo retaining ring off, the cover pops out, along with the fourth apply piston, the servo piston, second apply piston, and the servo return spring. The governor cover gets knocked off, and the governor slides right out. And onto the filter. Now a common problem with these, whether you're doing a full rebuild like we are, or just doing a transmission service, is the seal that seals the filter gets stuck down in the bore, and you have to fish it out. The auxiliary accumulator valve tube gets out of the way, along with the wiring harness and solenoid assembly. Then the TV cable gets unbolted, along with the throttle lever and bracket assembly. The manual detent spring comes off next, followed by the rest of the valve body bolt. The valve body can then be removed, but not before you fish out the manual valve linkage. All right, so we got the valve body off. You just have to be really careful with this because there's some very intricate parts in here. You don't want to mess them up. Also, the way this is machined, you got to be really careful. You can cut your fingers. Now, taking a closer look at the valve body, it may be a little intimidating, but it's just a set of passageways for the fluid to flow. And what allows the fluid to flow through these passageways are spool valves. Now, if you look at this spool valve, it has larger and smaller diameter sections. And depending on where it is, it will not allow fluid to pass through or allow the fluid to pass. Now with the valve body back on the transmission, you can see a little better how this works. This is the manual valve, and the reason why it's called the manual valve is because you manually operate that valve with the gear lever from inside the car. The position it's in now is park, and as you move the lever, you can see it go to reverse, neutral, overdrive, drive, second, and low. 
With the main valve body back off, the next thing to be removed is the auxiliary valve body and the accumulator. Well, we're down to the spacer plate now, which goes in between the valve body and the transmission housing. The most important part about this step is the check balls. There are check balls both above and below the spacer plate. And depending on what year your transmission is, that determines how many balls there are and their location. So you need to make sure you take notes of where the balls are. So when you put it back together, you don't mess it up. Now, the easiest way I've found to do that is to take photos. Stick around to get into the nitty gritty of our 700 R4 Trans Rebuild. Now we're almost finished with disassembly of the underside of our 700 R4. The only thing that's left is this detent and parking rod assembly. Now that we've got that out, we're gonna flip it up on its side and get into the guts. The seven pump bolts are first then a special puller can be installed, which gently separates the pump from the case. If you don't have a puller, you can pry out the pump, but you risk damaging both the pump and the case, so we don't recommend doing it that way. Our reverse input drum was stuck to the pump, so we just separated it once we got them on the bench. The input shaft and housing are next to come out, as well as the 2-4 band. Removing the input sun gear reveals the input carrier to output shaft snap ring, which is the next piece to come out. This frees up the output shaft, so make sure you have a hand on it when you remove the snap ring, or it'll hit the floor. The input carrier and reaction carrier shaft assembly comes out next, followed by the reaction sun shell and thrust washer. The low reverse retaining ring is next, and the easiest way to free up the low reverse retaining plate is by reinstalling the output shaft and knocking it loose with a rubber mallet, which frees up the entire reaction carrier assembly. A special clutch piston spring compressor is needed to compress the low reverse clutch spring, making room to get in there with a pair of snap ring pliers to remove the retaining ring, followed by the spring. A little shot of compressed air into the low reverse passage frees up the piston if it's caught in the case, which, of course, ours was. Since the kit came with the new case bushing, we went ahead and drove out the old one. Well, man, you've been making pretty good headway getting this transmission empty. Since you've got it done, I'll go ahead and get a jump start cleaning it up, unless you've got a problem with that. No, I appreciate it. About time you did something. Man, killing me. Well, I gotta get over here and get the rest of these internals tore down. All right, so what we're gonna do next is tear into the internals of the transmission now that we have them all on the table. We're gonna do that in the order that they came out. So the first thing we're gonna get to is the pump. We have to remove it from this reverse drum. Sometimes the drum and pump separate when removing the pump, which is okay as well. Well, I'm gonna finish cleaning up the rest of these parts and get the rest of the transmission disassembled. We're not gonna show you every intricate detail of how to rebuild this transmission, but for those of you that wanna see it, go to our website, powernationtv.com. For the steps to rebuild the transmission internals, hit the full episode section of powernationtv.com, click on Detroit Muscle, and look in the bonus tab. So what happens when you get 2,000 plus 55 through 57 Chevys together in one spot? Just maybe the world's largest gathering of Tri-5s in history. Five, six, seven Chevys are as big as, they, as they've ever been and maybe as big of a three year span of cars as there ever been. No doubt about it, these so-called shoeboxes are now American icons. And to think it all started 60 years ago with that first 1955 Bel Air V8. 
This first ever Dan Chuck Tri-5 Nationals in Kentucky lured owners of restored classics, race cars, and many second generation owners of the same car. Jeff Camasco's father bought this red 55 sedan in 1983. When I drove into this thing this morning and I'm just thinking, I can't believe I'm here. And to have that car for so long and enjoy it for so long, it's, it's amazing. A lot of these cars, like Jeff's, come with special family stories. Some have rare distinctions, like this 57 made for the federal government. You see, it's a station wagon with windows on one side and a panel truck on the other. Yeah, go figure. Now talk about your ultimate sleeper, a stock looking white and turquoise sedan that hides a 730 cubic inch V12 marine engine. The independently tilting hood and front end are designed marvels in themselves. I just enjoy the car. To me, it's, it's like having a work of art. This event wouldn't be complete without a gathering of Chevy gassers. Their modified looks are unmistakable, but in the day, it was more about function than form. They didn't make good compound rubber, so because of that, they used, uh, they lifted up the front end to get better traction. It was way cool to see some of those gassers back on the quarter mile strip, uh, wobbly wheels and all. Chances are a lot of these bow tie rides ran their first races on back streets down the road from the local drive-in. Chances are even better they never ran an autocross back in the 50s. However, quite a few heavy Chevys took on this unfamiliar territory. Well, if you find all this Tri-5 fever contagious and want to build up your own bow tie beauty, you could start here or with a new old body from the event organizers. That one's new, that one's new. There's another one over there that's new. It, 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 you know, people can't tell the difference and that, that's the quality. Like the cars themselves, this event's bound to become a tradition, an ongoing celebration of three landmark Chevy model years. Revered now more than ever, and no doubt by more generations to come. All right, so we just finished going through the internals of our 700 R4. Now, since we're switching over from four wheel drive to two wheel drive on this transmission, we need an output shaft, which we have here. Now this output shaft here is the one we took out. It's for four wheel drive and this one's for two wheel drive, the one that we acquired to go in. Now, when you switch over to this, you also need a tail shaft housing, which we got here. And we went ahead and put the new seal on there, which came with the kit. In the reverse order of disassembly, we started reassembly with the low reverse piston. And using the same spring compressor tool, we then compressed the low reverse spring and reinstalled the snap ring. The internal reaction gear is next. Then the reaction carrier slides inside of it. Followed by the wave plate, spacer, and a series of alternating steel and friction plates. The piston squeezes these together, which causes them to act as a clutch. The low and reverse clutch support assembly is next, which has a bit of a tight fit into the case, followed by the retaining ring. A new reaction shell thrust washer gets lubed and goes in next, followed by the reaction sun gear and the new beast reaction sun shell. The reaction carrier goes in next, followed by the input carrier assembly. Our new longer output shaft goes in next, and it gets a snap ring to hold it in place. The input sun gear can then go in, followed by a pre-mated reverse input drum and input housing and shaft assembly. 
The 2-4 band goes next, followed by the pump to housing gasket and the pump which needs to be torqued to 18 foot-pounds. All right, so we're back on the underside of the transmission. Got the manual shift linkage all hooked up. We're getting ready to install these check balls. Now, we're not going to show you where we're going to put ours because it could be wrong for your application because depending on what you're trying to do with it, whether it's drag race, truck pulling, stock, or whatever, there's a hundred different ways these things can go in. So make sure that you pay attention to your instructions because otherwise, you put them in the wrong spot, you're gonna burn up that fresh rebuild. The spacer plate's next. Now ours came new with the kit from TCI with new gaskets. Now they're marked C, that goes against the case. V, that's for the valve body side. The auxiliary valve body goes in first in order to align all of the holes. Then the valve body can go on, followed by the TV lever and bracket assembly. The one-two accumulator. The temperature switch, if equipped. The manual shift detent spring. The auxiliary accumulator valve tube. Then cinch everything down to a torque sequence of eight foot-pounds. The gasket goes on, and with the filter in place, so does the pan. The pan bolts need to be tightened, but not over-tightened to nine foot-pounds. The governor gets some lube and goes into place. Then the governor cover. And then the tail shaft housing. The new jumbo second gear servo kit from TCI goes in next. Followed by the stock fourth servo piston, the second and fourth servo cover, and the snap ring. All right, so the reason we had to replace that 2-4 servo is because the second gear applied piston was damaged. Got some debris caught up in there and it was seized up in the case. Now what that caused was one of our clutches to fail. You can see here, it's all burnt up. Got all the old stuff out, all the new stuff in. Now this transmission should be good to go. If you need to replace a cracked or missing console in your muscle car, chances are Classic Industries has the right reproduction for you. Like this 68 Camaro console that comes as a complete assembly with the gauge pod, the correct wood grain trim, and the shift indicator. They're designed for Camaros with either a Turbo 350 or Turbo 400. They're priced at about 750 bucks with the lamp wiring sold separately. If you've got a 2014 Mustang with that premium shaker sound system, but you want to upgrade it a little bit further, you want to take a look at this. This is the Kicker Power Stage Upgrade System, and it's designed to be a direct fit for your Mustang. It comes with its own 200 watt amp, and of course, this awesome 10 inch square subwoofer. There's no cutting, no splicing involved. You just plug it in and start jamming. By the way, Kicker makes systems for other late model applications as well. Having trouble finding replacement parts for your ultra rare Mopar? Well, look no further than Auto Metal Direct. They have a full lineup, even for the rarest of birds like a 1970 Superbird. This Superbird back glass from AMD features the factory color, fitment, and even date stamping. It's a Mopar Authentic restoration product and the only one of its kind on the market. But you better hurry up because there's only a limited number of these available, and I bet they're practically gonna fly off the shelf.